You know, that song was so good that I think maybe we should just shift gears and go to a katata today. No? All right. So I was trying to get Eric to do that little dance thing that they do. He wouldn't do it. So. All right. So good morning, everybody. Sp spring is sprung. So sprung a joke. It's like April Fool's a day early, right? So... Um, to start our uh, readings today, uh, we've got a psalm and an Old Testament passage, then we'll go into the New Testament passage that I'll preach from. And uh, to preface it, I'll just say that a lot of times in liturgical worship services, and I won't bore you with a, a whole big lecture on it, but they, they ask for all that, for a psalm, a uh, Old Testament reading, and a New Testament reading. And really that's so that you can see the consistency of the message that the Lord has for us. So I went and I found some passages that I really thought from the, the psalm in the Old Testament that are going to speak to the message that we have today. So if you just bear with me while I, I read through those. The first one is from uh, Psalm 33. It's verses 20 through 22. It's on page 350 if you're following along. Mine says 350. I didn't do it. So, all right. Well, if you're following along and can find it, this is April Fool's, um, a day early, I guess. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And now I cannot guarantee the page, but we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 5. Um, it does say in my little bulletin here that it's 718, but I'm not entirely sure now. Okay. Um, and this is one of my favorite passages because it's really God telling us what he really thinks of us. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I will give Egypt for ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. And now we can go to uh, our passage in Matthew. It's chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. I believe, again, it's on page 957. Very good. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not, you will not strike a foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left, and the angels came and attended him. Now if we could just say a quick prayer, and then we'll get on with the message. Lord, uh, 
We're all here today to worship you and thank you for all you've given us because all that we have and all that we are comes from you. Please, Lord, open our hearts and speak to them so that we may hear the message you have for us and see the will that you have for our lives. We love you, Lord. Amen. I uh, heard a story about a pastor who was going to preach on this very passage, and he thought it was a great opportunity because he had gotten some feedback that people really thought that, well, since he's a pastor, he kind of lives in a little bit of a bubble and, you know, he uh, doesn't necessarily experience some of the, the different hardships that maybe the, the common people do. Everything seems to just kind of roll off his back and he seems to kind of float through life and, and be a little bit of a, a pedestal there. So he thought, you know, this is a great passage, like everybody has to deal with temptation, right? So I can relate to my congregation. So he gets up there on Sunday and he's all ready to go and he says... Well, you know, I, I think that I can probably speak for everyone when I say there's probably not any of us who doesn't have any trouble resisting temptation. And he thought, of course, you know, like I'll be able to just roll right into, you know, my wife cooks the brownies and I can't resist no matter how much the doctor says and things like that. But unbeknownst to him, there was this booming voice from the choir. We'll call him Bob. Booming voice Bob. And he says... Uh, well, pastor, that's not true. Uh-oh. I don't have any trouble resisting temptation at all. So the pastor, wanting to roll with the punches and things, he said, Bob, you know, why don't you help us out then? Why don't you enlighten us? And maybe you could save a sermon, you know, because I'm sure these people are sometimes kind of tired of hearing me talk. You know, tell us how it is that you don't have any trouble resisting, resisting temptation at all. And Bob says, well, it's very simple. I just don't. Whenever I'm tempted, I just give in. So. <laughs> kind of reminded me of a, a personal story about a child that is somewhere between the ages of seven and nine who shall be not named or maybe named later. We don't know, but I don't really know. Um, but anyway, we're wake up in the morning and, uh, you know, um, bake some cookies, had them out to cool. Somebody was going to take them to Youth for Christ. I don't know who, but, uh, you know, when they cooled. And then, well, let's just throw her under the bus. Haley wakes up. <laughs> it's a lot easier to tell the story when we just say Haley. Haley wakes up. And she comes downstairs and she's very excited and says, Mommy, can I have some breakfast? Sure. What can I have, Mommy? Well, see what's out there. Well, Haley goes out there and there's cookies. Warm, freshly baked cookies. And there's leftover pizza. And I'm sure that, you know, in her logical little head, she said, I can't ask for cookies. So she went out and said, Mom, can I have leftover pizza? Sure, that's a good idea. That's not a bad breakfast. So then she goes back out to the kitchen and then scurries downstairs to, to watch, you know, something on the computer, do something on the computer while she's eating her breakfast and things. And, uh, you know, my wife goes to put the cookies into a bin, and there's eight cookies on every tray. It just works out every time. Eight cookies on every tray. There's six trays, so she's putting the cookies in, putting the cookies in, and there's eight cookies and eight cookies and eight cookies and eight cookies and, eight cookies and seven cookies. Okay, so then she looks, well, you know, like maybe she ate some pizza first. I mean, obviously, she, Haley's the only one who's in the kitchen. Well, there's no pizza missing either. Haley, did you take a cookie? No. Okay, maybe there was only seven this time. So, but then later, mom goes down while Haley's in the shower and finds half a cookie in the chair by the computer, so... Obviously, Haley and Bob had the same sort of philosophy when it came to resisting temptation. Just don't. Just give in. Um, so, but I thought uh, we could look at this passage and maybe Jesus could enlighten us on a little better way to, to deal with the temptations of our life. So, to understand the passage, we've got to back up just a scene and, and understand what just happened. Right before Jesus went into the wilderness, he was baptized. 
And, and at the baptism, we have this beautiful picture, and, and maybe some of you have actually seen it pictured where you have Jesus, and you have the dove on his shoulder, the Holy Spirit, and you have the light shining down, and that's, that's the Father, that's God, and all three of the Trinity are right there together, and it's this beautiful picture. And God says, this is my son. I love him, and I'm pleased with him, right? So really what God is saying right then, what the Father is saying right then is that this is my son. I love him now before he does any of this stuff that he's going to do for all of you. No matter what. No matter what happens from here on out, I will never love him any less. I always have loved him. I always will love him. And I think that this, if we take a time out from the message, this is a, a phenomenal message to pass along to the people that we care about, to our children, as often as possible. But then we get into the passage, and Jesus is led into the wilderness, and he's tempted. And it sort of made me wonder, like, why, why did Jesus need to be tempted? I mean, he was the son of God. I mean, we know hindsight, you know, Monday morning quarterback, that, that Jesus was the son of God. So really, was he going to have trouble with that? Probably not. So let's break down the passage. We've got some significant things in there. We've got the wilderness. We've got 40 days of fasting. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is proof positive that he was the son of God. I cannot get from breakfast to lunch some days without getting cranky. But 40 days, are you kidding me? That's crazy. He was alone. So if we look at the history of these things, I think that really what, what those do is they mark that it's a really important story because, you know, we look at the wilderness. The wilderness is a time where God would send his people to really establish their identity, to humble them, 40 is obviously a significant number. They didn't pick that number by accident. 40 is a significant number. You have 40 years that Israel spent in the desert. 40 days and nights that Noah. Pentecost is 40 days after the resurrection. So that, that's very significant. And then if you look at the, the fasting and alone time, for the people then, that would have been really significant because they would have understood that rabbis did that. Before they went into the, the inner sanctuary of the temple and gave the message to the people, they fasted and they isolated themselves so that they could just be alone with God. So maybe that's what it was all about. It was about trials and struggle and humbling. But I still thought, why did Jesus need to be humbled and go through trials? He was the son of God. And on top of that, like, who did the devil think he was? I mean, what could he possibly tempt Jesus with? And, like, why would he try? It probably wasn't even worth it, right? I mean, did he not know who he was messing with? So then I looked at, like, let's understand who the story came from. Because, you know, once you get into... The wilderness, there's only two entities, two sources that the story could have come from. It could, could have come from the devil. It could have come from Jesus. They're the only two who were there. I'm not sure it would have come from the devil. I mean, let, let's think about, like, what, what would his account be? Well, me and Jesus, we was out. The devil has bad grammar in my world. Me and Jesus, we was out there in the wilderness, you know, and uh, I thought it was perfect. He was hungry, he was tired, and, you know, he was separated, he was alone, and, you know, it was my perfect time to pounce. You know, so I told him he was hungry, so I said, feed yourself, and he didn't. And I, he, I said, you know what, like, you're so special, why don't you call your dad? And he wouldn't. And I said, you know, like, you can have everything in the world. And he wouldn't take it. He just told me to get lost. So obviously the story probably came from Jesus, right? Now, I would think that we would have to understand that that makes it a pretty important story. Because there's a lot of other times that Jesus was... The stand is saying, again, 56, God will take care of you.
be seated. Um, and now we're going to uh, take some time to, to go over our, our joys, our concerns. Um, in your bulletin, there's a little pink page. On the, the pink page are listed several of the joys and concerns that have been submitted through the prayer chain. And so as we, we do the prayer, you can read through. I encourage you to bring it home with you also and, and have it be a part of your prayer life because every time even a, a thought goes through our head of some of these people, it's lifted up to God and, and he knows that, that we care. Um, one addition would be Lynn Willard sent in a, a prayer concern. So if you want to make a note of that. Um, and now if you'd all join me in prayer again. Almighty God, we come to you today, some with joy in our hearts, and some of us, we're going through hard times. Help us, Lord, to feel your presence. Lord, you sing songs of joy as we celebrate, but Lord, you help us when we've fallen. You hold us close to you, and we just need to feel your love. Today, on our prayer requests, we've lifted up some, but there are others that are on our hearts. And know that as these people pass through our hearts and through our minds, that we are lifting.